Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the afternoon session of today's Atacam workshop. Uh, if some of you might have already realized, I'm not uh, Stephanie Gräfe. My name is Karl-Michael Thiem, and I'm working in the group of Stephanie Gräfe, and I am substituting as chair this afternoon for her. We have four, we have four interesting talks lined up. And I'm very much looking forward to interesting and stimulating discussions. I just want to mention two things very quickly. Number one, if anyone wants to ask a question after one talk, please raise your hand using the Zoom application. And second, after the four talks at 3.40, there is the opportunity for meet the speaker. Uh, please just lock or look at the Atubcam Workgroup 2 website. There you can find the corresponding links and use the password provided via mail to all participants. Okay, um, let's get started with our first talk, which is by Odoyon de la from the Institut de Chimie Physique in Paris, France. So incredibly sorry if I mispronounce anything here. Please feel free to correct it. And uh, they will talk about the promises of auxiliary DFT to investigate radiation chemistry problems. So please go ahead, Orléans, the stage is yours. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, sorry, I had a problem with my uh, Zoom on, on, um, on, on Linux and Windows, so it was a little bit problematic. Normally, I think it should be okay now. I will share my screen. Up. Oops. Oops. Is it okay now? Can you see the screen? Yes, so we can see it. Maybe you can go into a full, full screen mode or presentation mode. Yeah, how do you see it? For me, it is a full screen. Uh, for us, you, we can still see the slides on the left side. Uh, Maybe we can go to presentation mode if you go to view. Sure. In, in your PDF settings. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a PDF. Uh, yeah, go, let me have a look myself. If you go to... Is it better now? Yes, um, full screen mode. Yes, perfect. That's perfect. Okay, okay. I think I, lose, I lost uh, the animations, but it's not a problem. Okay. <laughs> so shall I start? If yes. it's okay for everybody? Okay. So, well, hello, everybody. I would like to... Uh, First, uh, to thank you all of you to be here, and also to, to the uh, organizers of this uh, of this meeting from the Cost Action. So I'm really, really happy. It's my first uh, participation, so I'm really, really eager to have uh, scientific exchanges uh, with all of you. So, what I would like to talk about today is uh, is the use of uh, auxiliary DFT to investigate the radiation chemistry problem. So we are uh, we are in a lab in the uh, University Paris Saclay in the south of south of Paris, and we are uh, essentially physical chemists, and we are interested in uh, radiation chemistry. So maybe I should just introduce a little bit uh, for the audience what uh, what what I mean by uh, radiation chemistry and what are the types of problems in which uh, we are interested. So so we are interested in the consequences of the interaction between uh, high energy particles like uh, X-ray or gamma rays or like uh, charged particle like uh, kilo electron volt, mega electron, electron volt, uh, proton, helium and uh, uh, nuclei the, when they interact with, uh, with biological matter. So it is, a, it is a known problem for a long time in uh, medicine and uh, biology because it is known that such uh, particles can uh, induce uh, chemical damages on DNA, proteins, lipid that lead to aging cancers. Uh, and, and so it is important to understand how they, how they interact. It's also, uh, on the other hand, uh, a promising tool for uh, radiotherapies and to use, for example, protons to cure certain cancers. But this type of interactions uh, are also uh, involved in, uh, in chemistry, for example, for uh, X-ray imaging of, of uh, biomolecules. 
in astrochemistry, where uh, the cosmic rays are probably key, play, key players in uh, the chemistry taking place in the interstellar medium. And for example, if we wonder about the formation of prebiotic chemistry and prebiotic uh, molecules. This is also an issue, this uh, ionizing radiations in the uh, aerospace industry. So when we send uh, electronic devices or human being beyond the Earth's uh, magnet magnetosphere, this ionizing uh, radiation can also ca have uh, important consequences. And, and, and finally, of course, we can think about nuclear chemistry where uh, uh, the, for example, uh, helium nuclei are produced in the reactors and can damage, for example, the reactors or uh, the effluents uh, in the output of, of the nuclear plants. So this is a, a general context. In our lab, we are essentially interested in the, in the case of uh, biological uh, irradiation uh, and essentially DNA and proteins. So. I usually like to start this kind of uh, presentation by making a strong uh, difference between photochemistry and radiochemistry. We also already heard a little bit uh, about such differences this morning with, uh, uh, with one of the talks. Uh, in photochemistry, we are usually dealing with low energy excitations, quite localized on some molecules. Whereas in the case of radiation chemistry, the amount of energy which is deposited within the biological structures is much higher, typically yeah, tens of electron volts per molecules. The energy is wi widely spread uh, with, uh, throughout the, the, the molecule. I take the example you, you can see on the left, it's, uh, it is what, what, what is called a nucleosome. So in fact, it is uh, the basic unit constituting, uh, constituting the, the chromatin uh, in our cells, and you see a double DNA strand which is wrapped around a core of proteins. Uh, and in this case, I, it's really schematic, but I illustrate the irradiation by a, a nuclei that would deposit a lot of energy in the red zone and induce a lot of uh, uh, chemical damages throughout the, 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 the trajectory. And of course, because we are dealing with ionizing radiations, a really huge amount of uh, secondary electrons, that's how they are called, are produced along the track and they further irradiate uh, the, the, the biological matter. So the, the situation is much more complex than in photochemistry. Already photochemistry is complex, but it, it, is, uh, it is also extremely complex here. So of course, the, the fact that such uh, ionizing radiations are uh, induced damages on biomolecules has been low, known for a long time and, and well, researchers have been working on that for decades. Uh, but there are still parts of the, of the scenery which is, uh, which is uh, I would say, black. Uh, this is a, a representation, uh, a 2D representation of, uh, of the consequences of the irradiation of the biological matter by, by ionizing rays. Uh, so I'm sorry, I don't have any animation now. It's a PDF, so it's a little bit messy. But <laughs> let, let's, for example, uh, just look at the, at the time arrow. Uh, you would start uh, at the attosecond time scale by the irradiation itself that will induce an electron dynamics within the system. A lot of energy is, is produced, is deposited, sorry, and this will uh, eventually well, uh, uh, leak into the nuclear modes. And so rapidly on the femto picosecond time scale, uh, you will have a, a coupled electron and nuclear dynamics. I think this is familiar for all of you, which will later lead to uh, the production of a lot of uh, reactive species that will induce chemical reactions on DNA proteins that will in turn uh, induce to uh, local, uh, well, deformation or rearrangement of the, of the, of the bio, biological structures that will on longer time uh, well, uh, damage and, and, and make the, uh, the biological uh, machineries less efficient or, or, or worse, in fact. So for a long time, in fact, in, in radiation chemistry, uh, I would say the picosecond to millisecond time scale was mainly uh, the time scale of investigation. And this was because uh, 
the time resolution of a pulse radiolysis experiment is limited to the picosecond time scale. So basically, we don't really have information in with such uh, experimental setup uh, below the picosecond time scale. So there are still many things to, to understand on longer times, but where we are trying to, to work is on the lower time scale from the attosecond to the picosecond time scale. And here, in fact, really few is known about the, uh, the mechanism of, of ionization, deposition of energy, the relaxation on the early time and the formation of the very first chemical damages. And this is where we are trying to work. So our objective, uh, I would say for long-term objectives are, are the following. We would like to understand, oops, sorry, uh, what we call the direct effect, uh, which is all the chemical consequences of deposition of energy within the biological structures and how, how it takes place on the how energy is deposited, relaxed, and what are the first uh, mechanisms that lead, that lead to chemical damages. So this is a general context. Uh, obviously, we need to, to work uh, from the attosecond time scale where we to, to describe the deposition of energy. And what we would like to know to, to do is to do that by first uh, principle approaches. We would like then to, to meet the sub picosecond time scale to, to really account for the ultra fast uh, chemical reactivity. And, and, and that's the hope, long time, long term hope to, to be able then to reach a picosecond time scale and to bridge to the longer term consequences. So this is a, again the nucleosome that I represent. And one of the hallmark of radiation chemistry is that you really need to deal with large molecular systems. Uh, we cannot just uh, consider a few, well, an, a, a few molecules with a few atoms because the physics of such kind of interactions involve a lot of, uh, of uh, molecular fragments, the emission of electrons. And so what we have been trying to do in the, in the last years was to, to start developing dedicated simulation tools uh, for, for this type of, of applications. So for the moment, we are essentially on the first stage, uh, very uh, attosecond to femtosecond time scale, and that's what I will show you uh, from now. So the, the outline of the presentation will be the following. I will so introduce you the auxiliary DFT framework uh, in which, uh, on which we are working, how we couple it to a polarizable force field to be able to tackle uh, uh, biological systems. And I will, depending on the time, show you a few examples of applications of our, of our tools uh, to radiation chemistry problems. So we are, for the moment, focusing on the deposition of energy by uh, high energy particles. And we, we focus for the, for the moment because it is the simplest for us on mass particles uh, that we consider as classical particles. I think it's a good approximation when we consider proton in the range of the mega electron volt or helium nuclei. So this is a scheme uh, showing you what, are, what is the kind of physics we, we wish to describe. Uh, it is uh, elastic and inelastic collisions of such particles with the electron cloud of biological molecules, uh, which will produce uh, electronic excitations, eventually emission of, uh, of electrons that we call secondary electrons. And what we would like to to investigate are the subsequent uh, energy relaxation and dissipation mechanisms, and also eventually all the charge migrations that could take place within biological systems. So we started from something which is well known in the literature, of course, that you all know is time dependent density functional theory. So we, we consider uh, the CONCHAM framework. Uh, here I, I give you the, the well known uh, uh, range and growth uh, time-dependent equations for the Concham orbitals uh, that uh, involve the Concham potential, Vt, uh, with uh, essentially three components here, the electron-electron repulsion, the exchange correlation potential. Uh, just as a remark for the moment, we only consider uh, simulations in the context of the adiabatic approximation, so we, we ignore completely for the moment uh, explicit time-dependence of the potential. And we have finally the external potential, 
that involve both the potential created by the nuclei of the molecules and of course the, uh, the potential created by the projectile that, uh, that will irradiate the, the system. So we wish to carry explicit propagations. So we have coded, in fact, Xiao Ching Wu has coded, coded all these equations in the software uh, Demon2K, which is a DFT, a DFT code based on uh, Gaussian type uh, orbitals. So we use, uh, this is uh, not, not new at all, uh, just to summarize, well known in the literature, we use a standard, if I can say, or well known and well established propagation algorithms uh, we have te tested various algorithms. Finally, the one we use is a second order uh, Magnus uh, operator, which is equivalent to the split operator. So we, we work essentially, we, we propagate in fact, uh, the electronic density matrix uh, and not directly the Kunshan orbitals, but, but just, for, just for the information. So this is uh, the propagator that we, that we need to, to evaluate that involve an exponential of the Hamiltonian matrix. This is, uh, this propagation is done either with, again, I go fast because I think it is, this is well known. We use either an iterative or a predictor corrector schemes to propagate the electronic density matrix in time at fixed uh, uh, position of the nuclei for the moment. Uh, so I can give you details on, on all of this, but I think this is uh, really not new. We are just working from what is known. And this is uh, what we are doing for the exponential of the matrix. So we, we, we implemented this uh, with expansions, essentially Taylor or Chebyshev expansions using the scalar pack libraries. So where we, we I think, started to put uh, new things into the framework is on the use of auxiliary DFT. So to, to get the potential that we need to do the propagation, we start from the definition of the electronic uh, energy. So this is all written in matrix uh, notations. So where you have the, the core, inter the core uh, contributions, so kinetic energy of the electrons and uh, interactions with uh, atom nuclei. The second term is the uh, electron-electron repulsion that involves the, the four centers integral, the exchange correlation potential, and finally, the interaction with the external uh, projectile. So to first, first thing is to avoid this four centers integral by the use of uh, variationally fitted uh, uh, densities, rho tilde, that you have here, that are expanded over uh, mono, uh, mono atomic centers that, uh, that allow to avoid completely the use of four centers integral. This is what you have in the third lines. Now you have only three uh, centers electron repulsion integrals. And the other thing is that we use these fitted densities also to evaluate the exchange correlation potential. So to get the potential, we, we get the derivative of the energy with respect to the density. And this is the last line. And, and as you can see, the potential, the Koncham potential, doesn't depend anymore on the Koncham orbitals. They only depend on the uh, fitted densities. Uh, so this is why this framework is called auxiliary DFT by Andreas Koster, who developed uh, this, uh, this framework. Uh, and so what we, what we tried to do was to see if this framework developed for uh, stationary DFT calculation was also suited uh, for um, real-time propagation. Uh, the use of fitted density for us as another uh, use is <coughs> to analyze the, the electron dynamics uh, that is evolving in time in our case. Uh, we, we wish to evaluate, for example, and investigate the charge migration process. So we, uh, we have to carry out repetitive uh, calculation of atomic charges, uh, typically every five or 10 attoseconds. And so for large molecular systems, it can be a quite uh, expensive uh, task. So we showed that we can also perform population analysis, provided some, some care is made. Uh, on the fitted density instead of the density. So this is an example. You have two, 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 two diagrams showing on large uh, benchmarks the error that was made uh, using rho tilde instead of rho to extract population atomic charges or, for example, atomic uh, intrinsic typos. So this is a, a, a rather safe uh, uh, use of the fitted density also for this type of uh, analysis. 
So we, we validated the auxiliary DFT framework for real time with uh, various uh, examples. So this is just one where we evaluated the solvatochromic shift uh, uh, for the absorption of this uh, dye. So this was, a, I will come back on this later, a QMMM calculation. So you have on the left, the electronic, uh, absor uh, the electronic spectra calculated with a standard linear response TDDFT calculation or with real-time TDDFT calculation. So you see that uh, you have to compare by color. This is, uh, oops, sorry, this is rather, uh, rather safe to use uh, auxiliary DFT. So we have, we have made other tests. Uh, this is safe as soon as we take uh, care that the auxiliary basis set that we use to expand the fitted density is uh, flexible enough. So the, the advantage of auxiliary DFT is, of course, uh, the, the computational performances. So we, we are currently able to treat up to uh, 1,000 atoms quite uh, routinely. So this is an example on, on a small peptide in water. So you have on the left the graph the, sorry, the computational cost for the main four tasks uh, that uh, involved in, in uh, such a simulations. So this was done for uh, well, the system that you see on the right, but increasing the size of the solvation shell. So that's why we have various sizes of the systems, which is given by the number of orbitals. And you can see that uh, what is quite re remarkable first is the calculation of the consham potential in red. You see that it is something which has a very good scaling and which is really well under control. This is all uh, PBE exchange correlation functional. So, so quite good uh, scaling, quite good uh, basis set. So it's, it's accurate. The population analysis also are quite, uh, quite uh, well, not, not so expensive. What is the most computationally costly is the calculation of the, the exponential of the Hamiltonian matrix in, in blue, which is imposing a, a rather bad scaling. Uh, however, thanks to the Scalapack library, which is used to do, to, to do that, you can see on the right that we still have good, uh, good performances and good scaling up to a few hundreds of, of cores. Uh, so, so it's quite well balanced, but of course uh, the story is not finished. And so we are now working on, on further increasing the, the efficiency of the code. Uh, so we are for the mo moment uh, migrating the implementation to GPUs for the matrix ex exponentiation. And we, we can also, we still have room to, to improve a lot of the, of the, of the performances uh, well, by working on the parallelization. I think it could be doable, it should be doable uh, with demon 2 k with this auxiliary DFT framework to treat up to well, hopefully yeah, 15,000 to 20,000 atoms within the next uh, few, few years. So, so I think the auxiliary DFT is a, is a good base, basis to work. So we then coupled this uh, auxiliary DFT to, to QMMM to be able to treat large molecular systems. So these are the various uh, schemes that have been proposed in the in the literature to to, to couple DFT or real time DFT to 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 well to QMMM. The the particularity of our scheme is to use a polarizable mo molecular mechanics force field. So we we wish to be able to handle systems like the one represented in the center with a, a QM region treated by DFT and the surrounding treated by molecular uh, force field. In our case, we wish to use a polarizable force field to take into account the instantaneous polarization of the environment by the electron dynamics, the electron density in the QM region, and vice versa. So to do that, we introduce an induced dipole on every mm atom that is uh, calculated from the polarizability of the atom and the electric field uh, felt by every atom. So we made various test, tests and showed that this uh, simple point charge dipole model was, was a, good, uh, a good model. And so the induced dipole further uh, influenced the electron dynamics uh, propagation uh, by inclu including the potential created by the induced dipole into the conscient potential. 
we have further introduced uh, the time delay uh, involved in the propagation of the electric field that mediates the interaction between the electron cloud and the polarizable atoms. And on the other hand, the time taken to polarize uh, the electron cloud by the induced dipole. So this has been uh, implemented in, in demon uh, recently. So we have validated the, the scheme for uh, various applications. Uh, this is quite standard, but we, we had to do it for, for our system. So this is a, a comparison of a, of a polarizable versus non-polarizable uh, QMMM absorption spectra for a, a, a DNA uh, base pair uh, in, a, in a protein DNA complex. So you see that the polarization of the environment can have an influence on the electronic spectra. And so it is important to take that into account. On the other hand, we also investigated the, the dynamics of the electron cloud as a function of the introduction of the, of the, uh, the polarization in the environment. So we took the same system and, and threw a proton, a one, me, a one mega electron volt proton into the, into the system. So this is the, the part you have on the right. So it's a, it's a small DNA protein complex. This is a QM region. Uh, and so what you have here are the evolution of the charges of the various uh, DNA fragments by color as a function of time. So you see that around one femtosecond, you have the collision of the molecule with the proton and that induce uh, uh, a lot of uh, fluctuations in the electron density. So the dash, uh, the plane lines are the non-polarizable QMMM simulations and the dashed line are the polarizable uh, simulations. So you see that uh, on the very uh, short time scale during the irradiation, both types of curves are superimposed. So the, the, the electrostatic uh, embedding doesn't really influence uh, the ionization mechanism itself. It's only after a few femtoseconds, if you look at the zoom, that you start to have some variations between the polarizable and non-polarizable simulations. But these differences are rather small to my point of view, and probably the polarizable embedding scheme is not mandatory at this time scale of radiation chemistry. Might have more importance in the future. I think I just have a few more minutes, right? You have, you can get five more minutes. Okay, so I will, I will go. Ahead. Okay, thank you. I was not sure about the time it started. Uh, thanks. So I will, I will finish with uh, one application of these uh, simulation tools to radiation chemistry problems. Uh, so, oh, and I will, I will give you the example of this uh, pulse radiolysis experiment that was done by our colleagues uh, Miran Mostafavi at Orsay who did pulse radiolysis experiment of this molecule in, in, water, uh, in, uh, in condensed uh, phase, in, in solution. And what was, uh, so what they are doing, it's a kind of, we would say a pump probe experiment, expect, except that they don't use uh, lasers, but they use uh, beams of electrons to induce a radiolysis. And they start to record absorption spectra five femtoseconds after the pulse, picoseconds, sorry, after the pulse. And what they saw immediately after the pulse uh, is something a little bit strange. Usually this type of irradiation is not really chemically selective because it's so energetic that you ionize, in this case, the three uh, subfragments of the systems proportionally to the number of electrons they contain. So if you count, you would expect uh, one third of ionization on the base of the, uh, of, of the sugar or of the phosphate, uh, more or less equivalently. But in fact, what they, what they recorded was only a signature of uh, the ionized phosphate a, a few um, a picoseconds after the pulse. So it means that in these systems, when the base is irradiated, there should be a very fast sub-picosecond charge transfer between the uh, probably the phosphate and the base. Uh, but they couldn't really resolve the mechanism. So this is why we started to to think about uh, what uh, theory and simulations could bring into that. So we first investigated if a charge, trans, a charge migration mechanism could explain uh, uh, a charge transfer from the phosphate to the ionized base. 
So this is the computational setup, as I told you, it's a, it's a QMMM simulation. And what I show you here are two kinds of uh, irradiation of the nucleobase perpendicular or uh, longitudinal to the, to, the, to the plane. You have on the upper graph the evolution of the charges for the three kinds of uh, the three fragments, U, P, and the water layer, and also uh, the sugar. So you have a very fast, uh, this is uh, typical of the irradiation at the beginning. So you have a, a first perturbation of the density uh, when the projectile which is charged is approaching. And then an ultra fast uh, ionization within a few hundred of uh, attoseconds that lead to the ionization of the, of the, sugar, of the, of the base. And within then the next uh, femtoseconds, you see that the charge is going down while the charge of the sugar is going up. So in fact, we have immediately after the pulse uh, in the next femtosecond, we have a delocalization between the sugar and the, and the base, which overall has a, a, a rather steady uh, charge. The electrons that were emitted are localized on the water layer that now have a, a, by difference with the ground state, a negative charge. But you see that the phosphate doesn't have any, any positive charge. Uh, so this was obtained either with uh, a perpendicular collision. This is the same with a longitudinal collision. We also did simulations where we simulated the radiation by classical electrons and we get the same, same picture. So we couldn't explain really the, the charge transfer from the phosphate to the, to the sugar and to the base by charge migration. But we saw that in fact, by charge migration, the plus that is all initially localized on the base delocalized also on the, on the sugar. We then looked to another kind of chemical reaction that take place on a longer time scale, that could explain the, the experimental observation, is a standard Marcus theory electron transfer. So this is again a curve extracted from our simulation approaches. And so we evaluated the, the rate and we found the, the rates within the a few tens of picoseconds. Finally, we could understand the, the ultra fast sub picosecond charge transfer by a non adiabatic decay. Uh, because, in fact, when we ionize uh, the molecule, most of the time we end up in this part of the potential energy surface. And upon relaxation, this uh, U, U plus SP uh, potential energy surface crosses uh, the other potential energy surface with a charge transfer to the phosphate from the phosphate. And the electronic coupling is rather strong. And so th this is what we think is taking place in the experimental. So I will, I will conclude now with, uh, so with some uh, just uh, remarks. So I, I showed you a few applications and uh, of the auxiliary DFT framework to, to problems of uh, radiation chemistry. So for us, it is really a, a beginning of a, of a long adventure, if I can say. So we, we still have a lot of uh, things to, to do on the, on the, on the, on the methodology. Uh, there are various things that I haven't uh, spoke about, uh, haven't spoken about today, uh, like the dynamics of secondary reactions, uh, nuclear quantum effects, also a lot of things about the basis set that we are really, really wondering about. And we have various applications going on with our colleagues in, in Orsay and also, uh, well, in, including biophysics, biophysics uh, physicists and also uh, people in, in Toulouse working in, in inter, interstellar chemistry. So, and finally, I, I would like to just mention that we are uh, looking uh, quite actively for young researchers who would like to apply for CNRS position uh, in, uh, in our lab so for, for the next year. So if you are interested, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to, to come and discuss with us. We, we have quite a broad uh, uh, area of, of expertise, both for development of DFT, but also for application. So, so we would be happy to, to discuss if you are uh, interested. And I will conclude simply by uh, acknowledging all the people who did the work and especially the this branch of uh, five people from Xiao Qing to Karim, who really did uh, most of the work that I showed uh, today. So I would like to thank uh, them a lot. My collaborators in, uh, in, in Orsay and in Paris, 
on the left, and also all the collaborators from uh, from Demon 2 k uh, with uh, with who we have a lot of uh, interactions uh, uh, quite uh, regularly. And I will fi finally thank you for your attention, and I'm of course uh, open to any question that you would have. Thank you very much, Rosio, for this very interesting talk. It's really nice to see how under the umbrella of acid chemistry we can have problems like we saw this morning from small <laughs> body atom that up until biological sized uh, molecules. Um, okay, are there any questions? So please raise your hand. If not, there's already well, a very short question in the chat um, um, by, um, let's see, Marcus Dahlstuber, is uh, it's abbreviated by Marcus. Um, he just says diabetic equals to non-adiabatic question mark. Uh, I'm not sure to what it was related. Maybe Mark, you can elaborate a bit more on this. If you're still here. Yeah, no, it's just about the, the semantics here in the, in the field. So is, is non-adiabatic the same thing as diabetic in, in, your, in your presentation? I, are you referring to the to the kind of uh, I mean to, to the kind of uh, exchange correlation potential we are uh, we are using, or are you talking, for example, of, of uh, non adiabatic uh, coupling in uh, electron nuclear? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess I guess the latter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so for the moment, what I what I showed anyway today was a pure what we call purely real time TDDFT. So nuclei are not moving at all. Uh, so for the moment, we have started to in, in, well introduce uh, electronic uh, electron nuclear non adiabatic coupling via the the air and phase MD simulation. So the code is implemented. We are testing it for the moment, but we we haven't. Uh, used Really used it in any applications so far. I don't know if this answers your, your questions. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right. Are there any more questions? Yes, I see a raised hand by, by Gilbert. Um, please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you for hello. the nice talk. Um, I have a question. So I'm a bit familiar with this uh, topic of radiation damage. Um, and um, when we do the simulations, we have this nice picture where like a particle was trespassing through basically the DNA and ionizing um, like substructures of the molecule all along its pathway. And what you, as you said, what happens is that you ignite um, all, all kinds of nuclear dynamics, ionizing, ionization processes, you have secondary electrons, and each of these secondary electrons on its own also starts a new cascade of processes. And you mentioned briefly that you, in principle, are able also to trace for these uh, secondary electrons and the involving effects. And I just was wondering, since you claim that you can do a couple of thousand atoms, and uh, with these simulations, um, uh, how, how far are you with tracing all these secondary processes? Do you impose certain cutoffs of like depth layers in the cascades that you can trace, or yes. yeah, how you are doing that? Uh, that's that's uh, well, you are familiar with this uh, topic, so yeah, I think that's a really really interesting and and for the moment still unanswered question: uh, where the secondary electrons? Are going and what they are doing in the, in the surrounding. As far as I know, I think it's not well known in the experimentally where what is the kinetic energy of these electrons in condensed phase. Uh, so for the moment, the problem we have, we we, we have some ideas to, to to work on that. For the moment, we we have the problem of the the fact that uh, electrons are um, indistinguishable. In, oh, I will have difficulties to say that in English. <laughs> that you cannot distinguish electrons. Uh, and so of course we have only the, the Concham density. Uh, so we are working with uh, my colleagues, uh, Julien Pilmé, who is working in Paris to see if we can uh, uh, develop uh, descriptors 
that would really allow us to track indirectly the secondary electrons. So this is something on which we are only starting to work. Uh, so far, we, we only indirect, indirectly said that secondary electrons are localized where charge is uh, accumulating during the dynamics with respect to the ground state. But this is only an approximation. In fact, we don't really track secondary electrons. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there is also all the problem of uh, electronic decoherence, which is completely absent from the scheme that I showed you today, mm -hmm. that make, uh, well, that has for consequences that we cannot, to my point of view, with the schemes that we are using, the standard uh, real-time TDDFT, I think we cannot, uh, without introducing decoherence, we cannot uh, simulate the, the irradiation and the attachment caused by secondary electrons that we produce uh, directly by ionization because they are scattered over uh, all directions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so finally, we, they are diluted in the surrounding. So, so the, so we are only at the beginning of that. So uh, I hope I was not too <laughs> claiming that we were doing too much uh, things. Uh, we are working simply on that. So I would be happy to discuss with you about uh, if you have any ideas. No, I don't think that I can help you there. <laughs> but but, but um, no, I was just very, yeah. when you said that, I was just very uh, curious <laughs> okay. how you are going to do that. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, very nice. So if there are any other further questions, I would ask you to postpone them to the meet the speaker session after the first talk. And I would like to thank Orion again for his very interesting talk. And we would now move on to our second speaker of this afternoon, which is um, uh, Felipe Zapata from the Department of Physics at Lund University in Sweden. And they will talk about implementation and value of the relativistic at a second trend in absorption theory within the dipole approximation. So, um, Felipe, please share it. Okay. I'm Go going on. to share the screen. Yeah. Can you see yes. uh, moving the, yes. the slides? All is good. All is good. Perfect. Okay. So, so thanks uh, a lot and um, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thanks for the organizers of uh, ATOCAM for making possible these conferences in these difficult times. These virtual meetings help uh, us a lot. I think at least help me a lot to keep alive the, the passion of what we are doing uh, every day. And also thanks Ladislao for all the technical uh, support. So I'm uh, Felipe Zapata, currently working as a postdoc fellow, as you said, in, uh, in at Lund University in the group of uh, Jan Marcus Dahlstrom. And the work I'm going to present today has been recently published and is a, a result of a strong collaboration with the group of uh, Eva Lindroff at uh, Stockholm uh, University. So before I started my job in uh, Marcus team, Jim, Jimmy and Eva, they developed a many body relativistic code with, where the, the source orbitals were computed at the Dirac Fock uh, level. So my work uh, consisted to extend this uh, code to the time domain in order to explore the, the electron dynamics under the influence of a time-dependent uh, electric field. So the time-dependent extension of the code allowed us to, to develop the, the relativistic at the second transient absorption theory that I'm going to, to present to, to you today. So. Um, as uh, you know, at the second transient absorption spectroscopy is used to, to study electron coherence and motion in atoms and in molecules. Typically, an intense uh, laser field is used to, to prepare an electron wave package in a, in a specific state or in a coherent superposition uh, of states, while an XUV pulse is used to, to prove the dynamics. And uh, in transient absorption spectroscopy, the, the target quantity is the exchange energy between the total uh, electric field and the atom. And we call this quantity uh, delta epsilon. 
uh, you can easily find general reviews on experimental and theoretical transient absorption uh, theory. Here I give you some of the most uh, famous, but uh, all the studies so far based uh, are based on non-relativistic transient absorption theory. So regarding uh, the lack of a relativistic uh, transient absorption theory that can handle a strong uh, fields far beyond the perturbative uh, regime, we decide to, to, der to derive uh, a relativistic ATS uh, theory based on the time-dependent Dirac equation within uh, the dipole approximation. So for the moment in our development is uh, restricted to, to the single particle uh, inter uh, interpretation of the Dirac equation. Uh, so in my talk, I'm going to first introduce you uh, the relativistic transient absorption theory. Second, I will show uh, the numerical simulations we have carried out in order to, to validate our equations. And finally, I will show you the extension of this uh, relativistic transient absorption theory that we have validated in, a, in one electron atoms to the case of uh, many electron atoms. <clears throat> So uh, let's uh, start. So uh, thanks to, to the conservation principle, uh, the agent's energy between the laser and the atom can be calculated as the energy absorbed by the atom from the electric field. Then uh, the total energy absorbed is given by the integral uh, of the instantaneous power running for all times. And uh, the instantaneous power is defined as the time derivative of the time dependent uh, expectation value of, of the energy uh, of the Hamiltonian of the Hamiltonian of, of our system. So basically the instantaneous power show us how the energy changes with time. And thanks to the RMFS theorem, we can compute this uh, instantaneous power at, at, as uh, you can see here, where the dot over the Time dependent Hamiltonians mean the time uh, derivative, and C of t is the electron uh, wave function. So, as uh, it is known, in, in presence of an external uh, electric field, uh, this quantity, the instantaneous power, is not a gauge invariant. That means that the total uh, Hamiltonian is uh, not anymore a constant of motion. This fact, uh, this fact will uh, imply that uh, we have a redefinition of the energy scale at each time step. And uh, this question is an old question and is addressed in many textbooks and uh, also a gauge invariant formulation of these uh, quantum mechanical problems was uh, formulated by Jung in the 70s and later also uh, co-proposed also another gauge invariant formulation, uh, but using the, the Dirac equation. Uh, for the moment, we have not implemented any of these uh, formulations, but in order to eliminate the gauge ambiguity, we decide to, to introduce a new quantity, uh, what we call the relative instantaneous power. And this uh, relative instantaneous power is defined as the difference between uh, the atomic instantaneous power and uh, the instantaneous power of a free electron uh, subjected to the same uh, time-dependent electric field. So in this way, the free electron system uh, serves as a physical uh, reference for the energy and for the power. And as I'm going to, to show you, uh, this uh, subtraction that we are doing uh, is going to correct the, the time dependent power without affecting the total energy gain. So uh, the, the derivation of the relativistic uh, instantaneous power uh, begins uh, then uh, with the uh, time dependent uh, Dirac equation, where the time dependent Dirac Hamiltonian is divided into the field free uh, Dirac Hamiltonian and the interaction term. Uh, here uh, you can see the field free Dirac Hamiltonian, where basically it, uh, these two first terms correspond to the relativistic kinetic energy of the electron. 
and uh, the interaction with the nucleus is described here uh, with the Coulomb uh, interaction. And then the alpha matrix is basically composed by the Pauli matrices. And the beta matrix is, is given here. So uh, within the dipole approximation, the time-dependent interaction term can be expressed uh, in the length form. Uh, where C Z, uh, means uh, is the, the electron position, E of T is the electric field, and little e is the, the electron charge. So after the derivation of, um, of the expectation value of the time-dependent Hamiltonian, uh, we can obtain the, the energy gain uh, by the atom, which is given by this expression, okay? And by doing the, the Fourier transform, we are going to obtain the Fourier, the, the frequency result, uh, energy gain uh, spectrum. So this uh, quantity, which is going to be gauge invariant, because at the end of the interaction with the laser pulse, this energy gain uh, is going to be a gauge invariant. So the frequency result spectrum is, uh, of course, gauge invariant where here a uh, set of T is the expectation value of the dipole, is, is the dipole, the time dependent dipole. Um, e dot E is the derivative of the electric field. And then, so what we have here is the, is going to be the Fourier transform of the dipole and the Fourier transform of the total electric field. And this expression is the same that we can find a, in the non-relativistic at the second transient absorption uh, theory. So uh, the second possibility is uh, that we can use uh, within the dipole approximation is to use the velocity form. Uh, in this velocity form, the, now the interaction term is given by the alpha, uh, the set component of the alpha matrix times the vector potential. So again, by derivation, uh, we can obtain the energy gained by the atom. And, uh, and by doing its Fourier transform, we obtain the frequency result energy spectrum. And now here, uh, the, the expression of the energy gained by, by the atom, uh, this uh, we can see very easily here in the velocity form that it in fact uh, corresponds to the classical uh, work. Here inside the integral, what we have is uh, the power um, and uh, we can interpret it, the product of C times uh, the alpha, the set components of alpha as the, uh, as the velocity, as the electron velocity. And E is going to be the force. So we are going to have here uh, the power and the integration will give us the work that we are uh, introducing into the system. And uh, again, here in the frequency resolve spectrum, we will need the Fourier transform of the alpha of the set component of alpha and the Fourier transform of the vector potential. So uh, now uh, the question is: after deriving uh, these uh, expressions uh, for the length and for the velocity gauge, uh, the important question is to know the, the limits of this expression if uh, they are valid for all uh, perturbation regimes. So uh, normally uh, the limits will be defined uh, by the domain of the physical phenomena that we want to explore within our theory. So the, the range of applicability is going to be controlled but mostly by two parameters. First of all, the atomic nuclear charge, and the second parameter is the strength of the laser field that we are going to use to irradiate uh, the system. So uh, from a very, a very general uh, point of view, you can see here this uh, representation. So uh, the horizontal black line uh, will uh, represent the, um, together the nuclear charge and the strength of the laser field. So uh, in one side of this uh, representation, we will have what we call the non-relativistic limit of the theory. 
Here, in this limit, uh, the atoms has uh, a very low nuclear charge, and the laser is uh, soft, uh, have a soft uh, strength. It's a soft uh, laser field, we can say. And then uh, we have all this region up to this uh, vertical black line, where the single particle interpretation of the Dirac equation is valid. Beyond this uh, uh, black, uh, this solid uh, black line, we are so beyond the single particle interpretation, and then uh, per creation uh, process has to be considered. So we are really in, a, in this uh, relativistic many body processes. Uh, here uh, we are really with very uh, high effective charges. So, for example, in uh, at, in nuclear collision experiments or using really strong laser fields that can uh, polarize the vacuum. But for the moment, we are not interested in this uh, region. So we are interested in uh, in the in the region of the single particle interpretation. And also on top of that, we are using, we are within the dipole approximation. So we have to stay uh, uh, up here, no? in, uh, to the left of this uh, dust uh, red line, where we, if we pass this line, we will need to introduce uh, um, uh, pues beyond dipole effects uh, into the, the description of the interaction with the, with the laser field. So uh, within uh, this uh, simple picture, it is uh, the first step for validate uh, our theory will be to, to, uh, to compare or to think that, uh, okay, if our, is our theory able to describe uh, the non-relativistic limit? So this is like the first uh, step and this will allow us to, to compare our results with the, with the well-established uh, non-relativistic uh, calculations using the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So this is the first step uh, in the validation of our theory to, to, be, to understand if we can reproduce uh, with our equations uh, the spectrum uh, in this region. So uh, in order to, to validate our theory, so we decide to, to carry out uh, different uh, calculations on the hydrogen atom, which is a very low relativistic uh, atom. And uh, we're using two different uh, scenarios. So the first is a very simple single uh, photoionization process. And the second one is a multi-photon ionization process uh, through a, a resonant state. We want to be able, if our, with our method, we can describe also multi-photon ionization process. So uh, here uh, in this first uh, figure, uh, you can see uh, the expectation values computed with uh, both the relativistic and, non and the non-relativistic code that we have also in our group. And uh, you can see the, the dipole, the um, electron position, and uh, the velocity of the electron. And you can see that they overlap. The, um, the relativistic and the non-relativistic uh, calculations. And uh, the error, the difference between, uh, not the error, sorry, the difference between the both uh, calculations are in fact, can, are found in the error introduced by the, by the propagator that we use to, to, to propagate the, the equations. So we can say that basically from a numerical point of view, both calculations are identical. In, uh, in these two figures here, you can see in the, panel, in the left panel, you can see the power transferred to the, to the atom. Again, uh, computed with the Schrodinger equation, with the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and with the time-dependent uh, Dirac equation and in both, in length and in velocity. We see that the length of the, that they, they overlap the, the calculations, but what we can see here is that this quantity is, a, as I told you, is, a, is a not gauge invariant. So uh, we see that they don't, uh, it's a different quantity uh, when uh, the laser field 
is uh, on, so they are completely, yeah, the oscillation, they don't overlap. And uh, here in the uh, right panel, what you can see is the energy gain by the atom. Again, here you can see that in the in presence of the electric field, the two quantities are not gauge invariant, but after the, the end of the laser field, when it's turned off, uh, this quantity is gauge invariant. So the, the total energy gained by the atom is uh, the same described uh, by the length or uh, the velocity forms. So in order to, to remove this uh, gauge ambiguity, I can show you now the uh, relative uh, power and the relative energy gain. So by subtraction of the, the power of the, um, of the free electron motion. So we can see that now uh, the power, the, the, the huge oscillations are decreased. So, but still uh, the quarks don't overlap. Okay, so they are still, this quantity is still, uh, is not gauge invariant. But at least we can uh, understand that uh, these huge oscillations that we can see here, they are coming from the contribution of the free electron moving uh, in the continuum. And, uh, and what we can see here in the, in the right uh, panel is the energy gain and the same. Uh, we see that it's not gauge invariant while the laser field is on. And then uh, at the end is gauge invariant. So now what we can do is to do the, the Fourier transform of this signal to obtain the frequency resolved spectrum, which is going to be a gauge invariant. And here uh, you can see uh, the spectrum uh, calculated for the four different uh, calculations with the non-relativistic and the relativistic. And also uh, you can see here the I put the Fourier transform of the uh, electric field. So uh, you can see that we have an absorption peak at the frequency of the electric field that we are, that we are using. Uh, then I will uh, show you now directly the frequency resolved spectrum for the uh, multiphoton ionization process. We are using uh, a two photon pump and then uh, a probe that from the 4S state we go to the continuum. And in the spectrum, we can see the two peaks corresponding to the pump and to the uh, probe. And uh, we see that our relativistic uh, code is able to reproduce this uh, non-relativistic uh, limit. So uh, now we are not going to, to stay here. We want to go to um, more interesting uh, uh, systems. So we have what we want to explore now is uh, heavy atoms like uh, uh, the krypton or xenon, but still uh, within the dipole approximation. So it's like we pass this uh, line, this purple dust line, and we will find in this region here now, uh, where uh, some uh, relativistic effects, such as the spin orbit coupling, uh, is a very important effect when uh, describing processes in krypton or in xenon. So uh, in order to, to describe the electron dynamics of these many electron systems, we decide to develop a relativistic uh, time-dependent uh, CIS uh, method. This relativistic TDCIS method is uh, based uh, is, uh, in the same philosophy of the non-relativistic uh, TDCIS method uh, developed in the group of uh, Robin Sandra, for example. So basically, <clears throat> this method, the time dependent wave function, is expanded onto the uh, single excited uh, states. And these single excited states are built up using the Dirac Fock orbitals that we obtain by solving uh, the Dirac Fock uh, problem. And uh, of course, the, the Dirac Fock orbitals are uh, four component spinors with the large and the small component and where the angular uh, part is going to be controlled by the quantum number kappa, 
with kappa, as you know, relates uh, the L and the G quantum numbers. <clears throat> so uh, we here I, uh, I present you the, the equation of motions that we have to solve. Uh, and uh, this is for the ground state, the coefficient of the ground state. Uh, and this is for the, the, the equation of motion for the excited uh, states. In order to solve the, these equations, we, we have implemented some uh, approximations to reduce the computational time. So for example, uh, one of the important approximation is as we are not interested in the per creation process, so we have removed from uh, our basis the orbitals corresponding to the negative energy states. So by doing this, we are uh, forced to, to, to use in the, in the time propagation the length gauge. And this question has been addressed before by Alejandro and uh, Eva Lindroff also that uh, we can see that uh, when removing the negative energy states, the, the best option is to do the propagation in the length gate. You and also, two more minutes. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, and then um, we have also introduced a complex absorbing potential to avoid the reflection and to reduce the, the simulation box. So finally, just to, to finish here in the, I show you the preliminary results for the Krypton atom. In the right uh, table, you can see the energies for few single ex excited uh, configurations. And in the left, you have for the same uh, configurations, all the uh, states that we have uh, when we solve the relativistic problem. So this is thanks because uh, the spin orbit uh, effect is embedded in our theory. So here with this method, it is not necessary to introduce ad hoc the spin orbit uh, coupling. We have uh, this already. So you can see here a comparison between NIST and our calculations. And here I give you some bis the bisplane parameters that we are using in our relativistic and the non-relativistic code. And uh, here is just a uh, transition using the relativistic and the non-relativistic code. And as you can see, uh, well, with the relativistic uh, code, we are able now to create uh, coherent superpositions of more state um, include, uh, that contain the, the spin orbit coupling. So there is still a lot of open questions and things that we would like to, to do, for example, to maybe develop a, a, a theory within the gauge invariant uh, formalism. Also, we would like to, to go beyond the, the single particle interpretation and why not to study the positron electron per creation using transient absorption. And this is in fact in the line of the, this article from uh, written by Alfred Maquette and uh, Rainer Grove uh, about this possibility of exploring uh, uh, yeah, positron electron per creation or relativistic effects with uh, the tools that we know and the methods from atosecond physics. And now we are, yes, finishing the extension to the many electron atoms. So thanks uh, for your attention. Thank you, Felipe, for this very nice talk about a very in-depth description of atomic systems. Do we have uh, any questions? Maybe let me have a look. Do we have any raised hands? As far as I see, there are no questions at the moment. So maybe let me ask just briefly before we go to the next um, speaker. Um, you compared to non-relativistic TDSE in your calculations and then for the hydrogen, but also I saw later uh, for the heavier atoms. Do you have anything on the timings? Like um, um, how, how much computation more demanding uh, your hmm. process? The, the time propagation uh, scheme uh, is not uh, is in the same order of time. It's not uh, so much. Uh, the important, the, the, the consuming part is to generate, to create all the all the bases and to compute all the, um, the, the matrix elements. 
Of course, we are using a polarized laser field. So we are reducing the moment, the angular momentum. So it's reduced. So we are M is equal to zero. So we are not, uh, for the moment, we are not considering uh, yeah, polarized laser fields or no. So it's conserved. The, yeah, the M quantum number is conserved. So this reduces a lot the, the simulation time. Okay, thank you very much. Then uh, thank you again for the talk. And we will go to our third speaker of the session, uh, which is uh, Thierry Tran from the um, Department of Chemistry, UCL, and also Imperial College London, um, the UK. And he will talk about control of electronuclear dynamics with IR pulse simulation with quantum Aaron Fest. So, Thierry, you're... Yes, uh, can you hear me first? Yes, I can hear you and you can share oh. your screen. You can start. Perfect. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And also, I would like to thank the organizer for the opportunity to present my work in this workshop. So, uh, well, as the uh, chair um, frankly introduced, uh, we talk about control of electronuclear dynamics uh, with the... Um, with the aim of, uh, of the infrared pulse and uh, the method that we'll be using the quantum manifest. So a bit of an introduction first. So thanks to the recent advance in attosecond uh, technology, now we have uh, better time resolution and spectra so we can finally uh, be able to monitor uh, electron dynamics and its effect of the electron dynamics uh, on the nuclear dynamics and also uh, allow us to unravel the mechanism be behind ultra fast phenomena. So in, in a standard attosecond uh, spectroscopy experiment, uh, there is uh, two pulses involved uh, in the experiment. The first pulse is um, the pump pulse, which comes come from uh, either a high harmonic generation source or free electron laser. And uh, the energy of this pulse can range from the uh, XUV to uh, soft X-ray and uh, energy uh, of, for this photon usually end up photoionizing the system and uh, because of the fact that we have uh, quite a small, uh, a very short time pulse, it means that we have a not so well defined uh, pulse in the energy range, so quite a broad uh, pulse in, in, in terms of energy range. So usually we excite, hit multiple electronic state at the same time. So we end up creating a coherent superposition of state, uh, in that case of the uh, cationic state. And then uh, as for the second pulse, uh, the, um, the probe or control pulse, the nature of the pulse may differ based on what uh, kind of um, things the experimentalists are looking for, either for to control the dynamics or, for example, doing coronization in order to probe uh, the electron dynamics itself. So the goal of my project was um, is to simulate the dynamics of molecule upon photoionization, photo excitation, uh, using the sudden approximation. So we don't include the uh, pump pulse in the dynamics. We just assume that we start with an uh, initial uh, state on the superposition of cationic state. And we want to investigate the effect of that electronic currents on the dynamics and also being able to control the uh, electron and nuclear dynamics uh, using a, inf um, a subsequent uh, control pulse and ultimately being able to reproduce predict spectroscopy uh, results. So the thing is that um, for the kind of simulation, there is many challenge. I mean, first of all, is a problem of the dimensionality. We have multiple electronic state, many degrees of freedom. So uh, if we have to do the full simulation in its full dimensionality, it can be quite expensive uh, itself. So we have to find a balance between the accuracy of the representation of the uh, electronic and nuclear wave function and the, uh, the time it takes us to, to run the simulation. So here on that slide, I'm just showing a short review of an available method for non-adiabatic dynamics that you can find in the literature, at least of a uh, most common one. Um, so um, the speaker from uh, this morning have already uh, touched upon the topic of a method such as a uh, Aims, uh, which stand for ab initial multiple spawning or MCTDH method. 
so I will just do a quick review on them. So, um, so you have a surface hopping method or uh, RN phase method that, that is quite popular in the literature where you um, represent the nuclear wave function with non interacting classical trajectories that propagate on potential energy surface that is often computed on the fly. Then you have the uh, um, Ames method where uh, you have uh, also classical trajectory, but they have the, um, the trajectory are interacting with each other uh, because you expand the nuclear wave function into a basis of Gaussian wave packet. And then the methods I'm using for, for my work, which is the uh, DDVMCG and one of the subsets, the quantum and phase, where we also have um, the nuclear wave function, which is extended into basis function, but on top of that, we have quantum trajectory. So I will mention later what I, what I mean by quantum trajectory. So in the DDVMCG method, we, we are trying to have a full quantum treatment of both the electron and nuclei with our initial method. And uh, for that, we solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation for both the electron and nuclei uh, using a variational solution. Uh, and similar to uh, other methods like AIMS or so, uh, surface hopping, um, most of the time the potent energy surface is computed on the fly. And um, so the thing is that uh, so in DDVMCG, the nuclear wave function is expanded uh, similar to AIMS in, the, in a linear combination of Gaussian wave packet, where you have the ex expansion coefficient A, the Gaussian wave packet themselves uh, uh, G. And uh, inside of the Gaussian wave packet, you have different parameters such as the width, um, alpha, the center of the position of the Gaussian wave packet, the momentum, and its phase. And um, the equation of motion for DDVMCG are derived uh, by solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation by using the Dirac Frankel variational principle, uh, which is just shown here, which um, allows us basically to to always uh, guarantee that we have the optimal um, time evolution of our, of our nuclear wave function. And thus we end up having what we call the quantum trajectory uh, for the um, when we integrate the equation of motion. So on the slide, you can see the equation of motion that we have for um, DDVMCG. So first we have the equation of motion for the expansion coefficient uh, that involve uh, overlap matrix, the Hamiltonian, uh, the time dependent overlap matrix. Uh, and then we also have the uh, equation of motion for the Gaussian parameter. Um, so inside of some um, um, character here, it's in all of the Gaussian parameter, uh, the, the width, the momentum, and the position. Um, also, the thing is that um, in, in DDV MCG method, we use a, a frozen uh, wave Gaussian wave packet. So the width of the Gaussian wave packet doesn't change with respect to time. So the only things that evolve in that case would be the phase, the center of the position, and the momentum of each of the individual Gaussian wave function. And in DVMCG, we, the equation of motion involves this uh, so-called C matrix that you have the form below that involve again uh, some uh, overlap matrix, uh, derivative of the overlap matrix, as well as the uh, uh, Hamilton, uh, the nuclear Hamiltonian uh, matrix. Um, and the, the thing is that in uh, DDVMCG, one thing we have to compute, so the potential energy surface is computed on the fly, and one of the approximation we do, um, because we evaluate only the, the quantity at the center of the Gaussian wave packet, but in order to properly do the interaction between the different Gaussian wave packet, we do uh, the so-called lo local harmonic approximation, so we expand each of the uh, the potential energy surface around each of the Gaussian uh, wave packet by uh, by co computing uh, the gradient and the second derivative. So uh, now I just I will just do a few mention about the quantum interface method. So uh, the quantum interface method is based on the uh, DDVMCG frame. So the nuclear dynamics is propagated in the exact same fashion with the uh, exact same equation of motion. The difference is that in uh, quantum interface, instead of having multiple potential energy surface, we uh, each Gaussian wave packet see only one potential energy surface, and the derivation for the method. Uh, can be started from the exact factorization itself. And because we only have one potential energy surface, it means that we have a time dependent uh, electronic wave function that is uh, that can be uh, itself expanded into a linear combination of a diabatic state. 
And the equation of motion for the electronic wave function is shown here uh, involving the electronic Hamiltonian and the coefficient of each uh, of the diabetic state. And um, what is particular with the quantum interface method is that the electronic wave function is propagated directly within the electronic structure code. So the advantage of the quantum interface is that since the electronic wave function is propagated directly within the electronic structure method, we don't need to compute all of the potential energy surface explicitly with the gradient and uh, second derivative. We compute only one potential energy surface that is a linear combination of all of the state with the respective uh, population, uh, electronic population. And we only have to compute one gradient and one uh, second derivative for each of the Gaussian wave packet. So now uh, I will just um, go on to the electronic structure method. So for my work, the main method I'm using is a complete active uh, space self-consistent field. Um, so the way it works, uh, uh, is pretty straightforward, is that you define an active space where you put some uh, orbitals that you uh, call uh, active orbital, and you just generate all the electronic uh, configuration state function within that subset of active orbital. So with that method, we capture the static correlation. Um, the challenge is the dynamic correlation. Um, you can capture the dynamic correlation um, by expanding the active space um, using CASCF directly, or if you want to reduce the cost of the computation, you can use a restricted active space, which is a subset of, of the CASCF method, or you can use a perturbative approach like CASPT2. So in order to simulate uh, the, the effect of the pulse within the dynamics, so the control pulse um, in our dynamics, um, we have implemented uh, the effect of the oscillating electric field directly uh, within the electronic structure method by including the uh, dipole uh, electric integral within the um, one electron Hamiltonian. So the effect of the pulse is only uh, is only treated within the electronic structure method. So the so the um, electronic wave function will feel the presence of the pulse, and we uh, do the integration of the equation of motion directly within the electronic structure method to include that pulse. And the form of the pulse is um, is a Gaussian shape, uh, uh, standard Gaussian shape pulse that is shown uh, here. So I will show um, now on the next, uh, for the rest of my talk, uh, I will show some results uh, um, on the investigation we have done on the control of the dynamics on aline and ethylene. So first we start with aline that we has you that we have used it as a um, two-state model system. Uh, so the aim uh, of that work was to um, see how we can control uh, uh, electron and nuclear dynamics uh, with the help of, um, of an infrared pulse. And uh, you can see on the right hand side, um, basically the, the shape of the pulse. So um, it was quite a large pulse uh, compared to a standard atto second pulse. So we have uh, quite a, a few number of cycles uh, within our pulse. So um, in, a, in a case of a two-state system, the, um, the general solution for the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, if we have to solve it by hand, um, will obtain uh, the, the following solution for the electronic wave function, where you have state one and state two, uh, where they associate in time um, respect to the um, energy of the state. And if you were to compute the density of the um, electronic wave function, uh, you will uh, get that following equation. And uh, you see that if we look at the important terms that, um, that shows the time uh, evolution of the two populations, so basically the oscillation between the two states, um, we see that the oscillation uh, between the two states depend on the energy difference uh, between the states. So, the smaller the energy difference is, the longer uh, is the uh, oscillation, so the electron dynamics oscillation. And, and so um, if we reach a conical intersection where basically uh, the two states are degenerate, we uh, expect to see a collapse of the electron dynamics. So basically, we'll, uh, you will see um, during the time when it's going through the conical intersection, it will be a kind of a flat line. 
And when we do the dynamics itself, so the thing is that um, without uh, you here, we do a comparison of the uh, of the dynamics of uh, Aline uh, with the quantum and first uh, method uh, with and without the pulse. Uh, also, um, something I forgot to mention is that the pulse, we have aligned it in the Z direction, which is basically along the direction of the molecular axis uh, of the molecule. And um, we we see from that dynamics, uh, given the initial condition we have, uh, we go to a conical intersection at roughly uh, between uh, 10 to 15 femtoseconds. So we see this collapse of the electron dynamics in the spin density. And um, if we look at the adiabatic population um, of the cationic state, um, when we compare the no pulse and the pulse, uh, we see, first of all, a quite large effect of the pulse on the adiabatic population itself. And um, as a consequence of it, it is that if we monitor the spin uh, density, uh, so the spin density basically allows us to monitor uh, where the hole is located on, on the molecule. Uh, in the case here, we do the spin density on one of the uh, carbon atoms on one end of the molecule. Uh, and then so we see this nice electron dynamics associating. And then as soon as it reaches the coquinical intersection, uh, we see that there is a collapse of the electron dynamics and the pulse affect um, how it goes through the coquinical intersection. And um, we um, and by looking at the effect of this electron dynamics uh, on the nuclear uh, dynamics, we see uh, the oscillation of the two um, CC bond length. And when we put the pulse in the dynamics, we see that all the spin uh, end up at some point locating on one end of the molecule. And as a result of this, we see that one of the bond length uh, is getting more stretched than the other. So we, we are getting asymmetry in the molecule. So we are converting into an asymmetric stretch of the molecule. So now uh, I will move on to the uh, ethylene um, work that um, that we have done that is currently ongoing work. So again, it's a similar goal. We want to investigate the effect of um, the electronic currents and the initial electronic superposition. Um, so what is this electron dynamics and its effect on the nuclear dynamics and as well as what happens when we include the pulse in the dynamics? How do we affect this electron dynamics and nuclear dynamics? And this work is based on the already previous uh, experimental work where they have uh, um, photoionized molecule. Uh, so they are um, using a pump pulse that come from HHG source. And using the photoionization cross section, they managed to determine what was the relative weight between the different uh, cat uh, cationic state. Uh, based on the different harm harmonics they, they use to photoionize the molecule. And uh, one of the main results they observe is, of course, different nuclear dynamics. And its direct effect is that they have a different fragmentation pattern based on the uh, HHG pulse they use to photoionize the molecule. And um, one of the subsequent work uh, they have done is that they have included a control infrared pulse in the dynamics, and they managed to change the fragmentation pattern uh, of ethylene um, using the, the same forward pulse uh, based on the time delay of the pulse itself. So, so um, ethylene is a rather small system and also a highly symmetric uh, system. And uh, usually when we treat non-adiabatic dynamics, uh, involved in conical intersection, uh, we often like to use symmetry rule in order to determine what is the degrees of freedom that spawns uh, spawn the different conical intersection. Um, so we can easily rationalize based on the symmetry of the state, what will be the degrees of freedom that will lead you to the decay to a conical intersection and what is the mode that lift the degeneracy between the state. And the thing is that this um, um, argumentation can be also uh, used for dynamics outside of conical intersection when you generate a superposition of state that that main that doesn't have to be um, close in energy or even degenerate um, in energy. And uh, so. In order to um, for that symmetry rule, what you have is that uh, you need that. Um, this uh, irreducible representation of the electronic state one, electronic state two, times the irreducible representation of the no normal mode of a certain symmetry should give you the totally symmetric mode. 
Uh, and this is a symmetry we will use for current current intersection, and we can apply it for uh, general dynamics, as I say, for uh, a superposition of state. And uh, we were trying to investigate the dynamics of eta lin by uh, looking at it uh, by a pairwise, by pair of state. Um, See so if we can rationalize the complicated uh, dynamics where you have uh, where they have photoinergies the system to uh, multiple state by um, by dynamics of a subsequent pair of state. So on, on that slide, it's a summary of uh, basically what we obtain when we do the symmetry uh, product for the um, uh, ethylene cation. So on the left hand side, you have the uh, symmetry label of the different um, cationic state. Uh, in the D to H point group. And the right hand side, you have the uh, normal mode motion as well as the symmetry label. And for example, if we have to treat a superposition of state uh, for the uh, D naught and D1 state, um, the, no the normal mode that uh, leads to the conic intersection is uh, torsional motion. Uh, and for the state, for example, the D1, D3, um, the motion that uh, lead to the conic intersection would be normal mode 9 and normal mode 7. So um, in, the, um, in the mass uh, experiment, what they have observed, uh, the main photo product um, was the fragmentation, so the loss of uh, one hydrogen or two hydrogen. So in our dynamics, we analyze mostly the dynamic by looking first at the torsional motion and the uh, normal mode 9 to 12, which correspond to the 4CH vibration. So on that slide here, uh, we you can see the result for the dynamics where we have initiated the, our ethylene cation on a superposition of a 50-50 D not D1 state with and without a pulse. Uh, so the pulse, we have put it in the y direction, uh, which correspond again uh, along the uh, molecular axis. And um, we can see that um, on the adiabatic population, with and without the presence of a pulse, we don't see large effects uh, from the presence of the pulse itself. But on to the nuclear dynamics, um, we see quite a consequential effect from, from the pulse. I mean, first of all, um, from the from the symmetry rules, we have determined that in the superposition of a D1, a D0 state, the main leading motion will be the torsional motion, which is uh, shown here in red. And we see that the, um, initially our uh, nuclear wave function is totally symmetric. So due to the symmetry of the wave function, we shouldn't have any gradient in any uh, direction uh, that breaks the symmetry of the wave function except the totally symmetric mode. Normal mode 10 is one of these totally symmetric mode. And we see that the first mode that show asymmetry uh, is a normal mode 4, um, which is what we expected from the uh, derivation of, uh, from the symmetry rules. And as soon as we move along the torsional uh, mode, we lower the symmetry of the molecule. So it's no longer a D2H um, uh, symmetry point group. Uh, it, it become a lower point group, which is uh, in that case a C1. And just all the motion becomes symmetry or low in that new point group. And uh, due to the character of the state, one of the uh, normal mode we expect to see the, um, the gradient appears is along normal mode uh, 11. And we can clearly see that normal mode 11 here in purple is picking up as soon as normal mode 4 has uh, break, broken the symmetry of our nuclear wave function. And we, if we have to represent the, the dynamics in a different way, for example, by using the, uh, the whole location, so on the uh, left-hand side, what we have plotted is the configuration state function uh, linked to the uh, orbital um, on each of the four CH bond to see where the charge is located on our molecule. And uh, in the case of the no-pulse dynamics, we can see quite a chaotic uh, oscillation of the charge between um, both ends of the molecule. And as soon as we put the pulse in the y uh, direction, we uh, end up creating an asymmetry um, um, of, of our um, of the, of the charge oscillation, and we end up seeing it uh, located on one specific end of, uh, of the molecule. So it would be the CH2, uh, well, this one is CH3, so CH2 and CH5. So we end up uh, on one specific, uh, on two specific uh, CH bond. And uh, if we translate it into uh, the nuclear, uh, the, um, the CH bond length, we see that in the case of the no pulse, 
we uh, deposit energy into two bond length. So the thing is that uh, in our dynamics, we cannot simulate uh, fragmentation itself because it's, um, it's a phenomena that occurs uh, much uh, longer uh, later down uh, in the dynamics, often in the time scale between from nanoseconds to maybe a microseconds, whereas here the dynamics is done in the femtoseconds window. So we can only uh, give a uh, um, qualitative picture on where the energy is deposited. We cannot say well, what is a quantitative um, fragmentation uh, ratio, but here we can uh, basically say that we have energy deposited into two bond length, whereas as soon as we put the pulse first, we dampen the fragmentation um, effect, or at least the energy deposition, and we only deposit uh, energy in one uh, bond length in that case. So the main conclusion is that so dynamics uh, initialized on the specific in, uh, superposition of state uh, can be rationalized using uh, symmetry rules. We get Konica intersection like dynamics even outside of region of degeneracy. And we see that electronic currents play quite an important role on the initial motion of the nuclear wave function. And when we include the pulse in the dynamics, uh, we induce different electron dynamics, and by consequence, we uh, also uh, get a different nuclear dynamics and thus a different photoproduct. So uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Graham or of group, as well as Professor uh, Micro for the supervision uh, and the help for throughout this project. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Yeli, for this interesting talk. Um, if there are any questions? Please use the reaction or help you uh, raise your hand button. Um, I will have a look if there are any. Not, not so far, at least. Um, maybe I'll just start with a short question. So you were. We were talking about um, that you need to include in your um, quantum chemical um, approach, you need to include uh, dynamic correlation. You have the static with a, cast, with a complete active space, and you need to include dynamic, and you were giving some example, and for example, um, perturbation theory or something like CASPT2. And I was just wondering, because you then talk about conical intersections, mm -hmm. how well does CASPT2 then still work? Like when you go into conical intersection region with intruder states or um, problem that some perturbation gets too much weight in your calculations? So I, I, I haven't run dynamics with CASPT2. Uh, I, I know a bit from, um, from uh, working with another colleague. So the thing is that uh, is for the CASPT2 method, you have a different uh, Hamiltonian. So you have the single state, multi-state, and uh, extended multi-state uh, CASPT2. And, and, and I know, for example, when you want to treat conic and intersection more accurately, usually you tend to end up using extended multi-state CASPT2 for the kind of things. And uh, there is also um, um, uh, this uh, uh, IP shift uh, that you can uh, use in order to um, remove introduced state, but from um, there's one paper now, I can't remember the author, but where they were uh, discussing about this IPA shift uh, that may be just um, a factor that you don't want to include because it's a arbitrary correction that may not work all the time. Okay, thank you very much. And we do have another question. Um, um, Hubert Dordiol, please unmute yes. yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I have a small, uh, maybe more technical question, but I think it would be interesting to see that the advantage of this method is that it's dealing with uh, like uh, one single state for each Gaussian mm -hmm. uh, that is the, like similar to the Ehrenfest trajectories. And uh, I was wondering uh, how do you uh, express this electronic state? So you are using CASSCF and you were saying that you need only one gradient for the electronic states to propagate it and evolve it. But then if you expand it on um, CASSCF states, I would expect that you have to calculate the gradient for each of the CASSCF states that are involved. Yes. Uh, is it true? Uh, so the thing is that um, this is the reason why I say that the particular flavor of our quantum manifest method is that the electronic propagation is done directly within the electronic structure method. So in the case of uh, CASSCF, uh, we so we have an active space uh, where we end up, let's say, for example, having 120 configuration state functions, 
our RN first state is written as a linear combination of this uh, 120 configuration state function and we propagate this coefficient in time. So we, we never compute explicitly the adiabatic or diabatic state itself. We compute only one state, which is the RN first state, which is just, uh, the, in that case, the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger uh, equation. Okay, okay. And the gradient is gen just then calculated using these coefficients? Uh, so the things that we also don't compute the uh, adiabatic gradient, we compute the gradient for that specific current first state. So okay. because of this, we end up, uh, we don't use, uh, when we compute the gradient and the second derivative uh, using the uh, CPMTSCF, we don't solve it for the, um, for the simplified CPMTSCF. We use a full CPMTSCF to solve the equation because we don't have uh, eigenstate. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, I do see that there are uh, two more hands raised, but uh, unfortunately we have to move on to give our uh, fourth speaker enough time. I would ask you, Morgan and Alicia, to address your question in the meet the speaker session after the fourth talk to Tia directly. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. And 